So tonight we'll be talking about secret blessings. But first, I want to do a little testimony real quick, because any of y'all who were here, last girl talk in December saw my awkward hand. I fell while ice skating, if you weren't here last time. And um, but all of the pain is gone. All of the strength is back. So praise God, because I didn't know you could miss doing dishes, doing laundry, <laughs> but I did. You can miss doing it without pain. That was my thing. I was doing it with pain and not trying to say something. And I mean, I wanted to complain so much because I just wanted to. I was like, how can I take care of four kids and with one hand? But um, I knew that would hurt my faith. So I did what most of us need to do in trying circumstances. We just need to keep our mouths shut. So that's what I did. So here's my mini sermon before I get started. So number one, don't complain. Number two, don't get discouraged. And number three, receive your answer and your blessing in your, in your healing. That was what I was waiting for. So don't complain, don't get discouraged. So now to blessing secrets, our text for tonight is 1 John 3. And I'm going to read all of it because it's all great, like all the rest of the Bible. But, <laughs> I mean, we can all learn something from it. So I'm just going to start in verse 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that we, when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. And I was going over my notes tonight, right before service at home, and Austin I was like, man, so many preachers, I don't understand why they teach against that. It's, it's shocking that they teach against that. But here it is, it's in the Bible, verse 6. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. And that's so, I love it, so blunt. I like it. Just tell me straight. So <laughs> this is my, if you like me, this is your chapter. It is straight. <laughs> This is a message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongues, but with actions and in truth. This, then, is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our, heart do, our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commands us. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. 
So point number one tonight, God's love lavished on us produces God's blessings. I'll say it again. (laughs) God's love lavished on us produces God's blessings. We are blessed because God loves us, and it's that simple. We are children of God. As much as I love my children, it doesn't compare to God's love for us. So like John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So God sent his only son to die and be born, raised again from the grave for you. And um, I realize some of you might not have grown up feeling special or even feel special now. Um, Just don't waste any more time uh, feeling that way. God made you. And I brought (laughs) this Veggie Tales book just to make my point clear, God made you special. <laughs> we, I've read this book, and I've heard it sing, and thankfully it does not sing anymore. I will not be replacing the batteries. It's a little high-pitched for me. But I'm going to read it because it's, it's good. And you'll, you might get something from it. God made the heavens, the land, and the sea, the fish and the oceans, the birds and the bees. He grew all the plants, put fruit on the trees. He made everything. He even made me. He picked out my smile, my eyes, and my nose. He was very particular from my head to my toes. I'm just what he wanted, and I think it shows that he's really creative, and all of heaven knows. He might be really creative with some of y'all. No, just kidding. (laughs) Okay, he thought it all over. He made me just right. I make him happy. I am his delight. When I look in the mirror, I see his touch because God made me special and he loves me very much. It's longer, so I'm going to cliff note it here. God wasn't finished. No, he had more to do. He planned something wonderful. That's when he made you. He thought it all over. He got it just right. You make him happy. You are his delight. When you look in the mirror, you'll see his touch because God made you special and he loves you very much. And then it would sing, not... I'm not going to let it sink. <laughs> but it's so cute. And then it has a mirror to reinforce. He was talking about you. <laughs> you are special. God made you. And I hit my notes. So, but um, that, this is something that we need to enforce in our children. But also we need to model. You know, we can't be insecure or, you know, unsure of who we are. We are God's children. And I like... Um, the chapel song the kids sing, I am who God says, who God says I am. I can't even say it without singing. But anyways, it's cute. It reinforces to them that what matters is what God says about their life. And that's, you know, because there's so many different inputs we could get. But what they need to know is the Bible is true, and it's true concerning them. So next, Christina is going to be talking about walking in love. Good evening. So point number two for tonight is walking in love produces life, miracles, and blessings. And um, for that point, let us read in verse 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. And this is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Walking in love produces life, miracles, and blessings. And we we have ways to walk in love. We all know ways to walk in love. It could be a compliment. It could be going out of our way and doing something for someone. How many of you here love when you get criticized? Nobody. But then, um, how many here say, I love when I get a compliment, an unexpected compliment, and not a side compliment where you think, was that a compliment or was that a, <laughs> wait a minute, I said thank you, but <laughs> maybe I should have said, hmm. <laughs> but a true compliment. And we're all encouragers in the body of Christ, and we all have the ability to encourage each other. And you know what's, What's great about knowing God's word is that even on our worst days, after a long night of getting up and down, 
or um, something keeping you awake all night, being on your mind, we all have the ability to every morning wake up and look in the mirror and renew our minds to Christ and say, today will be a good day. Even if you have a three-year-old that's like, I don't want to go potty. That's usually what Emma tells me every morning. I don't want to go potty. I went yesterday. (laughs) I'm like, well, today is a new day. (laughs) We're still going to go. You say, no, today is a great day. Today is an encouraging day. Today I am going to do what's required, and I'm going to do it cheerfully and happily with a willing heart. We love one another, and we walk in love with each other, with our words, with our actions, and with the way that we treat each other, not just around Valentine's Day, but every day. And, you know, um, one way I thought of that we can do this is, you know, unsolicited advice is just not helpful. But sometimes when you see someone in need, you know, like uh, I took Emma to the zoo, and so I took one of the little uh, push strollers that my mom had, and one of the wheels, it, it, I think it was Sophie's when she was born. She's eight now, so it's gone through so many grandkids, and one of the wheels just keeps getting stuck. So I was going up this ramp to try to get into the cafeteria so I could get Emma something to eat. And I was trying to get it through the door, and you're just like, oh, my goodness. You know, it'd be simpler to take the wheel off and push it on three. (laughs) But this mom who had a couple kids of her own and was pushing her own stroller came back from the inside door because she saw me trying to push it through, and she said, here, let me hold the door for you and just lift the wheel up for you. But, you know, she didn't turn around and go, wow, you're struggling. (laughs) Wow, you're having a hard day. Wow, you've only got one, and, you know, you can't make it through the door. (laughs) But she, you know, just stopped and told her older kid to, you know, stay with the younger one, and she came back to help me. Sometimes we have to stop what we're doing and just be a physical help to those around us. When we see a lady around us, another mom that just needs a helping hand, let's just give her a helping hand. And, you know, sometimes we may think we have the perfect advice or we have the right thing to say, but sometimes people have heard it all, and that's not what they need. They need a physical helping hand to be an encouragement to them, to walk in love. So we love one another, and we're also givers. Let's go to verse 17 in 1 John 3. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. So with actions, also by the things that we do for other people, that we give, and we know to give generously, but also thinking about what is our motivation? Is it to be seen, or is it to be generous givers on every occasion, and not just to be seen by other people as our motivation, but having that that generous spirit in all things. You know, stopping to take time to help someone, or stopping to take time to be an encouragement. Or sometimes um, with little ones, if you have little ones in your home, you know, sometimes all that they need on a very busy day is patience from you. You know, patience from mom. And um, what can we do and what is our motivation behind it? A lot of times, um, you know, loving each other, being giving, walking in love, producing life, miracles, and blessings, a lot of times it starts with our thought life. Our thought life is so powerful And I think sometimes we don't realize that when we get stressed, when we get discouraged, when we uh, live inside of our emotions, it's all stemming from our thoughts. And yes, other people do play a part. But most of the time, our thought life is getting carried away. Or it's not where it should be. So we have to guard our hearts, and we start with our thoughts. We still start by what we're thinking and what we're feeding to ourselves. You know, um, whether you're trying to get out the door, one thing happens, another thing happens, and you're trying to say, let's put our shoes on for 15 times. 
and we have to put our coat on. You don't like that coat, oh, I'm sorry, it's very cold, you have to wear the coat. Every, you know, you're discouraged, you get in the car, you're losing your patience slowly and gradually. You know, a thought life. Um, if we wake up in the morning, we renew our minds, we get control of our thoughts. And, um, you know, when I found out that I was pregnant again, um, I had to control my thought life every single day. You know, Satan, he is a thief, and he is a liar, and he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he does that not just physically, but he will do that to us mentally and emotionally as women. We have to guard our thoughts. And like Jessica was saying, don't speak it. Your, your worries or your concerns or your lack of patience that day with kids or spouse or coworkers, sometimes we can't speak it. You know, um, after several miscarriages in a row, I woke up every day and had to rebuke Satan for the fear and the worry and the thoughts. Whatever you're struggling with, whatever Satan says is your life or on you or whatever the doctor's report says, you don't speak it. And you wake up every day and say, today is God's day. God has a plan and a purpose and his will is what's done. And you just have to guard your hearts by guarding your thoughts. And sometimes, most of the time, it's probably better just not to speak anything, but that God is good. And that's it. No matter what the circumstances may be, that we look to him in all things, that he is good, his word is true, and that Satan's number one goal is, you know, he's not going to show up on the porch with, would you like, would you like sickness today? Would you like me to take one of your family members today? You know, you get to choose. But he's sneaky, and he comes in as a friend that says, hey, you don't want to go to church anymore. Hey, you want to come out with us and do these things. Hey, your kids are horrible. My kids are horrible. Let's just sit around and talk about how horrible our kids are so we go home even worse off than when we left. But we have to watch for how cunning and deceptive he is and how he is a devourer, you know, and he likes to sneak around and figure out what our weaknesses are. It is a spiritual battle each one of us faces, and he will come into our lives to discourage us. To what? What's the purpose? Well, our purpose is, you know, found in scriptures like Ephesians, to live a life worthy of the calling we have received. No matter our profession, no matter our career, no matter whether we're a stay-at-home mom or we're working full-time or part-time, you know, no matter what stage of life you're in, we, our calling is to win people to Christ. But if we're discouraged, if we're down, if we're stuck, we can't look around and be a blessing to other people because our thoughts are so consuming in our everyday life that we're hindered. So the Satan's goal is to get us off track, get you off track, to get your husband off track, to get your kids off track, because his ultimate goal is that nobody should go to heaven, that that nobody should. And, you know, our thoughts are powerful. We walk in love to produce life, miracles, and blessings. So we walk in love. And a powerful way to walk in love, um, I know, and I like what... Vicky said when she was passing out the gifts, especially for the younger girls here tonight in any age. But sometimes, you know, as a woman, you have to do things to help yourself feel special. And that's a good thing, to invest time in yourself and say, you know, today I have to do something for me. Honestly, for me, at this point, it's usually involving a candy bar at the checkout. <laughs> And Emma gets some, and everybody's happy. But but whatever makes you smile, you know? Um, And sometimes you just have to say, you know, God, you are with me today. And God, you, you know my thoughts, and you know my heart, and you know how Satan's attacking me, but you are with me today. And so take time to make yourself feel special, you know? And sometimes that can be time alone. 
Other times it can be having, um, making time to have coffee with a friend, or it could be pampering yourself a little bit. All good things. All good things, because why? When we feel better, we smile. And those people around us start to smile again, right? Um, and then let's go to um, Proverbs eleven twenty four and 25. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper, and he who refreshes others will be refreshed. You know, there are some people, and you're around them, and you instantly can't help but smile or feel as though they just speak life into you. Always happy, always patient, always cheerful. And you know what's key about those people is you know that they're not more special than everybody else. But what's amazing is, is they always look for the positive. They always look for the good. They always talk about how good God is, even when you know that they are also going through their own circumstances. In all things, we praise him. In all things, in all times, no matter our circumstances. Because, you know, God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Not just when we're going through the great times and the awesome times, but when we are going through the times where we struggle and where we really need to seek him. Verse 19 in 1 John 3, this is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. So we have to be careful of our hearts. What is our motivation? How can we love God? How can we love our families? And how can we also love and take care of ourselves as women? You know, there are times when all of you, you don't have to admit it, where we all go into the bathroom and we shut the door, we think about locking it if you have little ones, and you just think, I'm going to take a two-minute breath. I'm going to breathe for a moment. To what? To regain your patience, to regain your happy thoughts, whatever it is. Sometimes you just take a time out for yourself to recharge yourself, to take care of yourself. And that way we are better women, friends, Wives and mothers. But walking in love produces the, the life and the miracles and the blessings that we are wanting. Pastor Sue's coming. So 1 John chapter 3, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us. That's the verse we began with as Jessica began our message this evening. So we're loved. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us. So all his love is for you and me. All of it. There's nothing withholding. Lisa doesn't have more love of God. God doesn't have more love for Lisa than he does for Sue or for you, Ashton, or for you, Whitney. In other words, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us. And because of that great love, we have the right to every blessing in the Word of God. We have the right to every blessing whether it's prosperity or health or whether it's children and a quiver full or more, whatever it is, a husband, the desires of our heart, whatever the desires of our hearts are. So it's because of that great love, as Jessica shared her first point and then Christina, that one of the blessing secrets is we have to walk in love. We have to walk in love toward one another. Uh, that's one of the greatest commandments. First of all, that we love the Lord our God with all our hearts, all our souls, and all our minds. And then secondly, that we love one another as he has loved us. So uh, we have to walk in love if we're going to be blessed by God. Because it can't just be about me. It can't just be what I'm wanting for me. You know, the root of every sin is selfishness. The root of every sin. I don't care what the sin is. It, I, the sin can be overeating, it can be, it can be adultery, the sin, it doesn't matter. At the root of every sin is selfishness. And so um, the opposite of selfishness is selflessness, is a giving of myself away. And that's what he talks about in this uh, chapter in 1 John, 1 John chapter 3, that we're, we're to be like Christ, we're to lay down our lives for one another. In other words, we're to be giving. We're to be giving. We're to be selfless. You know, and the, and the secret 
of the gospel is the more we give, the more we receive. Because we're not, we're not looking for what we receive, but it's, it's contrary to the way the world does. The world is into taking, taking, taking from one another. But the gospel is about giving, giving of ourselves, giving to one another. And the more you give, the more you receive. It's, it's, a, it's a reverse thing. It's, it's opposite the world. And so our third point is blessing secret is about uh, to have the blessings of God, you've got to have confidence before God. I have to have confidence before God. He says there in verse 21 of 1 John chapter 3 and following, dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask. Receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. This is how to receive the blessings of God in a nutshell. We receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. So if our hearts do not condemn us. So first of all, uh, if I'm going to have confidence before God, I've got to keep my heart clean. I've got to have confidence before him by keeping my heart pure before the Lord, keeping my heart clean. So I've got to keep a clean heart. That's what David wrote about in the Psalms. Create in me a clean heart, O Lord. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. So keeping my heart clean is a big part of having confidence before God. So when I go to God in prayer, when I ask him for, for a miracle or an answer or, you know, a new grandchild, or when I ask him for something, if my heart condemns me, see, then I'm not asking in faith. I'm, I'm hesitant to ask. But if I don't, there's nothing in my heart that's separating me from God, then I can, I can ask him freely because he, he is all to me and I am all to him. He ha I have all of what, it, what God has, and, and he has all of what I have. So keeping that heart clean is critical to having confidence before God. And then it says, and we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands. And so that's the other part of that. Uh, it's obeying his commands because obeying his commands is part of what keeps my life right, my heart right, uh, because I'm doing what his word says to do. You know, it's, it's easy. It's like um, anything a small child would understand. This thing of doing what God's word says, obeying his commands. He says, because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And then it says in verse 23, and this is his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he has commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. So we do what pleases the Lord. We honor him. We honor him, and how do I honor God? Well, I honor him by doing what his word says to do. It's that simple. It's not complicated. It's not a mystery. You know, uh, we called this message Blessing Secrets because people act like it's a secret. How do I get blessings? How do I get a miracle? How do I get answers to my prayers? It's like this big mystery, you know, and, and uh, people go to all kinds of extremes to get their prayers answered. And it's, it's laid out here for us in plain English, so easy, like one, two, three, or A, B, C, I do what pleases him, and I honor him, and I keep my heart right before him so that my heart doesn't condemn me. And so because of my heart doesn't condemn me, then I have confidence before God. And when I go before him, I receive from him anything I ask. And so we do what pleases him. We honor him by honoring his word and doing what his word says to do. And a, and a, a big key is just living that way. In other words, daily consistency. I'm not, I'm not who I am on Sunday, but then Monday through Saturday, I'm a completely different lifestyle person. You know, you don't run into Pastor Sue at um, Fat Daddy's, and I've got the short leather mini skirt on, and I, you can see the tattoos on my midriff because I'm wearing a halter shirt. No, no. Consistency is the key daily. 
You know, it's, it's, it's who we are in Christ. We live who we are in Christ. We live out his word. It's a daily thing. It's what we say and do daily that matters. So my challenge to all of us is let's give God, and we're just barely into February. Next week is Valentine's. And so we're talking a lot about the heart tonight and about keeping our hearts right before God and receiving from God the blessings of God. You know, but it's not a secret. It's really not a secret because he lays it out in plain English for us that we just keep our hearts right before him. We do what his word says to do. We honor him and then he honors us and he honors his word. And when we ask what we desire, we receive what we desire. We receive the blessings of God. So let's challenge ourselves. I'll challenge myself. You challenge yourself to give God the rest of this year and Honor him on the Lord's Day. Be in church every Sunday. Don't miss. And if your husband wants to lay out and miss, well, that's part of my conclusion. Pastor said, I really should do a message entitled, What to Do When Your Husband is a Jackass. <laughs> I said, it's the Valentine's girl talk. I cannot, you know, say my message is what to do when your husband is. So... I want to just wrap up this message by saying, if you have a stubborn husband, or if you have a husband that sometimes acts mulish or like a donkey, or he doesn't want to serve the Lord, you know, the word of God is so great because there literally, I, I believe, is an example in the word of God of everything that we could possibly need to know about. Everything that people go through is talked about in here, very practically. So three quick examples of women who have to deal with husbands, and sometimes, um, you know, in a very challenging situations. So your first example, and you can read this on your own, it'd be great weekend reading, the book of Esther in the Old Testament, Esther queen to a pagan king who got rid of his first wife just because she didn't show up for dinner. So you know what kind of, you know what kind of, you know, testy guy he was. And so she appealed to him on a, a life and death issue by putting on, the Bible says, her royal robes, getting all decked out and preparing a delicious banquet. And she didn't do this just once. She did it several times before she made her appeal. So she was a wise woman, and she knew how to get his positive approval before she asked her very important question and got the desires of her heart. Second example, Abigail, Old Testament again. She became one of the wives of King David. 1 Samuel chapter 25, I'm just going to read two verses. You'll have to read the passage yourself because I could not describe it better than how it's stated in 1 Samuel 25 verses 2 and 3. Speaking of her husband, a certain man in man who had property there at Carmel was very wealthy. So this was a rich guy. He had a thousand goats and three thousand sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, like you all are. But her husband, a Calebite, was surly and mean in his dealings. So she's a beautiful woman, she's intelligent, and he is a jackass. So, as Pastor would say, that is a biblical word. It is what we normally say, donkey. So <laughs> what did she do? So he, he put the whole, he put his family, his, his land, everything at risk because David and his warriors were coming through and they were there and they were protecting this man's sheep and property and that. And then when it came time to shear the sheep and to have a big festival and everybody gets all they want to eat and all that, David sent someone to speak to him and say, we've been protecting your property, because you understand this is when everybody was out there in the middle of the open, and people would come in and try and steal and that, and so he said, we, we've been out here protecting your property, protecting your sheep, protecting everything, and so he said, in return, would you just give, us, give me food for my men? Well, he was a surly and mean-spirited man, so he basically said, absolutely not. Who are you? I don't know this David. Get off my property. And so, of course, David and his warriors were going to come in and kill them all. But Abigail, when a servant told her, 
because she was wise, not just beautiful, but because she was intelligent and wise, she thought, well, my husband is unreasonable. I can't appeal to him, but I have to do what's right to protect my family and all of these people we're responsible for. So she got busy and got her servants to help her and got all the food to David and his men and, sent, and then went herself and petitioned to spare their lives, which he did, and he thanked her because that way innocent blood was not on his hands, blah, 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 blah. But I say all that to say this as an example because sometimes we have to do what it says about Sarah, third example, you know, Sarah, Sarah and Abraham. But in the New Testament, it also talks about Sarah in several places. And one of the places that talks about Sarah is in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 6. He said that we are also to be like Sarah and do what is right and do not give way to fear. And so Abigail did what was right. She didn't give way to fear. She didn't just, oh, woe is me. My husband's a fool, and we're all going to be killed today. No, she, she did what was right for herself and her family, and, and they were spared. Now, not so good for her husband, because the next morning after he was done with his festivities and eating and drinking all night, she told him what she did, and the Bible says that he became like a stone, and in 10 days he died. I guess he had a heart attack or a stroke. I'm not sure. Bible doesn't say, but, you know, in other words, well, <clears throat> too bad. So he's, he's gone, and then David says, do you want to be my wife? She says, yes, so now she's a queen. Well, so... <laughs> My point being, <laughs> right priorities. First of all, first of all, I am not the wife of Jean Lingerfell. First of all, I am a daughter of God. And my God and his word are first in my life. So I do his word and I live a life pleasing unto him. And then I honor my husband, and I, I serve and love and respect him and our children. But there, if push comes to shove, if my children want me to sin or my husband wants me to sin or be a party to their sin, I say, no, I'm going to serve God and his word. So y'all just get happy and follow me as I follow Christ. So God first, then husband, children, and then after them, others. And that is the only way to live. You see, how can we receive, as it says in 1 John 3, how can we receive from him anything we ask unless we obey his commands and do what pleases him? So we, we have to have the proper lineup in our lives, the proper loyalty structure. We have to understand how great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God, the daughters of God. And then once having received this love, then that we walk in love toward one another and do what's right, and then that we keep our hearts pure and clean and we live a righteous life because he is righteous. And that all that means is we just do what his word says to do, and that covers us because then we're walking right with him.